Hello and welcome to lesson two, cognitive psychology, long-term memory. So we've looked at short-term memory already. We understand that it has a limited capacity, a relatively short duration, and most of the information is coded acoustically. Now we're gonna look at long-term memory and we're gonna also consider the same coding capacity duration features as well as some key research. And then we're going to move on after this to the multistore model and bring all the different types of memory we've looked at so far together. So here are some key research questions that I will be asking you in class. I'm not going to spend time going through them now, but have a think. Uh, and again, 80% pass rate for this one, please. So this is a model of the distinction of different types of long-term memory. One thing that we definitely know about uh, long-term memory is that it's not a unitary store. It's not one big store in which everything's coded the same way or treated the same way. In fact, we have multiple memory systems in long-term memory. And it depends on the type of experience that you're trying to re remember and encode. It depends on the type of information, the type of memory it becomes. So, the main distinction is between two systems, one called the procedural memory system and the declarative memory system. Sometimes procedure is called implicit. Basically what it means is, or non-declarative, it is that information that you don't have conscious access to. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a moment. Then we have the declarative memory system. This is you know, memory that you do have access to. So let's take procedural memory. The classic example of procedural memory is something like uh, riding a bike. So it's a non-declarative long-term memory. It's implicit, we don't have conscious access to it. You can't access the memory of riding a bike. You have to get on a bike, start pedaling, and then the, you remember how to do it. You could go years without performing a procedural task and uh, suddenly pick it back up relatively quickly. There are some limitations to that, of course. Another skill that's procedural for a lot of you will be playing an instrument, whether it's the guitar, uh, the piano, whatever it may be. You'll notice that as your fingers are moving, they are doing so unconsciously. When you start to learn to drive, this is one of the most uh, significant procedural skills you'll learn um, and procedural memories you'll develop in the next few years. When you first start, it's a very conscious and, and energetic process. It drains you every day. And after you've been doing it for a few years, you can get from A to B without even realizing uh, or remembering any part of the trip. So it does not require deliberate or conscious thought. You can access it by doing, it's sometimes referred to as knowing how. And another type of implicit memory is the condition response, which would fit into this category. The alternative to non-declarative is declarative. And this is memories you can declare, you can speak, you can say, I remember when, or I know this. These come in two, two flavors. In this case, we have episodic memory. These are episodes from your life. Sometimes this is called autobiographical memory because it's about you. And these episodes might be what we did at the weekend, the last holiday we had, uh, that funny joke that Mr. Val told in psychology class, it could be whatever. Um, but specifically an event with some sort of time and place associated with it. Semantic memory is a bit more elusive. This is your facts and your figures and your general knowledge. Um, language also comes under semantic. Semantic just means meaning. And we'll come back to that word uh, a bit later. So we have these three types, procedural, and then we've got the episodic and the semantic. Now long-term memory is different from short-term memory and we kind of know it's a separate store. We don't know how separate it is. We don't know, for example, if it's a completely isolated store, if it's integrated partly with short-term memory. But what we do know is it differs in terms of its coding, its duration, and its capacity. So in terms of coding, information is largely stored semantically by meaning. Though of course we know we've got um, episodic memories in there as well. We may have some visual and acoustic memories too. 
The duration of long-term memory is what sets it really apart from short-term. It can last from seconds to a lifetime. That phone number that someone just told you may ring around in there for a while, but if you remember it, it could stay there for the rest of your life. You'll probably never forget the faces of your children. I hope I never, um, barring dementia and Alzheimer's and things. That would just be there with you forever. You may on your deathbed be able to remember this very YouTube video. It's unlikely, but possible. Because memory can last that long. Language, for example, definitely lasts that long. Capacity. The best thing about it, and I've heard students say, I just can't fit any more information in. It's nonsense. It's absolute rubbish. There is no limit that we know of. Now, I always say no known limit, therefore virtually unlimited. I always caveat it because the universe is likely finite. We can't understand infinity. So to say that the memory is infinite is probably flawed. But for all practical intents and purposes, it is virtually unlimited. So that's long-term memory. Now, as you might imagine, investigating long-term memory can be quite challenging. Think about this. I want to know, for example, how long you remember a fact for. So I teach you a fact. Well, in order to find out how long, you might remember that fact for the rest of your life. And if you do, I have to somehow be there at the end, which, you know, it's unlikely that I'm going to outlive you guys. So this research is incredibly difficult to do. And that's why relatively most of the research, uh, almost 90%, I would say, or more, that I've come across is on short-term memory. People busting out um, the Brown-Peterson technique or digit span tasks because they're easy, they're quick. You can do them in a three-year degree or a four-year PhD. You can't do a longitudinal study on memory in a four-year PhD, so it's much more challenging. But the landmark study, the real uh, pioneering work in this field, was carried out by Barry Kettel. They took graduates uh, from a particular high school and investigated, carried out investigation over a 50-year period. Now, Barrack wasn't there at the beginning of the study, obviously. Um, this would have been retrospective data, and we'll talk about what that means in a bit. 392 um, participants were shown photographs of their high school yearbook. For each photo, participants were given a group of names and asked to select the name uh, that matched the person in the photo. And this constituted the recognition group. The second group, so we've got an independent group's design. They don't take part in each condition, they take part in one. In the second group, uh, participants were simply asked to name the people without being given a list of possible names. So it's a visual recognition task. You have to see the face and conjure up their name from long-term memory. First one, recognition, name and picture. Second one, just picture. And there was a third condition in which participants were asked to just free recall uh, the names, but that wasn't that important. What Barrick found was that participants were 90% correct even 14 years after graduation. Uh, after 25 years, these participants were about 80% correct. After 34 years, it was 75% correct and accurate. And uh, even after 47 years, there was a 60% accuracy rate. The second group though, so that was for the first group. The second group uh, who had to identify the photos without any cues, uh, they were only 60% correct after seven years. So, this dropped to 20% after the 47 years. So, just compare these numbers. 47 years for group 2, 20% accuracy. Uh, 47 for group 1, 60%. Well, what does this tell us about long-term memory? It tells us that you're much better at recognition than you are recall, which has really important implications, actually, for your revision. It's why multiple choice uh, quizzes are relatively useless because they rely on recognition unless they're carefully crafted. Whereas recall is the absolute gold standard for memory. But it's also much more challenging because that's where we lose a lot of the information. So 
this is a pioneering study that really investigated the duration and nature of long-term memory. Um, Barrett concluded that uh, people can remember certain types of information for almost a lifetime. And this is referred to as very long-term memory. Here's a chart showing the uh, nature of different memory systems. So this is the free recall condition. Uh, this is the picture recognition um, condition where they're to match up the names and the faces. And then the name recognition, which was a list of people in their class. Evidence for the distinction between procedural and episodic memory then. Is there evidence for this? Well, one study by HM, and we're going to look at HM in a lot of detail in a few lessons time. One study of HM, a case study. Uh, Henry Mullison suffered um, ep from epilepsy, extreme epilepsy, and had part of his hippocampus removed. This affected his ability to form new long-term memories. He couldn't do it. However, when researchers gave him a task, a mirror drawing task, they did find over a period of time that he actually improved on the task. Now, Given that he couldn't form new long-term episodic memories or autobiographical memories, he couldn't, for example, recognise the um, researcher that had been working with him uh, for many, many uh, months and years. He couldn't recognise uh, the place, the hospital environment he was in, where he lived, anything like that. Given that he couldn't form new long-term memories and would often read the same magazine over and over again. You shouldn't be able to form any type of new long-term memories if LTM is unitary. But because he got better on the task, this suggests that his episodic memory is separate from his procedural memory. Because he got better, he learned new procedural skills. In other words, you could teach an amnesiac like Henry to ride a bike, but you could never teach them if they didn't already know what a bike was. They had to keep forgetting it. Um, that'd be an interesting study, actually. This suggests that skill learning is distinct from other types of long-term memory, such as episodic and probably semantic. Evidence for the distinction between episodic and semantic, this comes from Spears, Maguire and Burgess. Uh, in 2001, they reviewed 14 cases of amnesia. Parts of the hippocampus and fornix were removed. You can see the hippocampus here. Um, when you remove it, it actually looks a bit like a seahorse. And the fornix is just uh, represented here. This is actually the hippocampus here. Um, they had parts of these removed. And in all cases, there was an impairment for episodic memory. But actually, they found semantic uh, memory was relatively resistant to that impairment. And again, if one thing is affected but the other isn't, we say they're separate. So there's a good, uh, this is relatively good evidence that episodic and semantic memories are distinct. However, there is one limitation to the idea of episodic and semantic. So if an episodic memory is something like your 16th birthday and who was there and, and what you were doing, and a semantic memory is your knowledge of um, Peterson and Peterson study or Jacob's study from last time well all semantic knowledge begins as an episode so I went to school today and I learned about Peterson and Peterson and then later on you understand semantically what the Brown Peterson technique is or I went to school today and I learned about digit span and then six months down the road you understand what digit span is but you may have even forgotten about the original day you learned it. So it's not clear in this model, in this idea, when episodic memories become semantic memories, but we suspect that's the pathway that they undertake. Um, so further evaluations, uh, at least two of the piece of research um, involve case studies. These are limited for a variety of reasons. One is they may lack external validity, they're based on one individual case. You may not be able to generalize that and so forth. Another is that given the highly unique circumstances around each amnesia patient's um, amnesia, the degree to which you can say it's damage to the fornix or damage to the hippocampus that caused the memory dysfunction 
is actually questionable. Often amnesiacs have other areas of the brain damaged as well. It may be um, parts of the visual cortex, maybe parts of all, all sorts of different structures. Therefore, you can't exclude that some of the uh, functioning or amnesia may be related to that. So it makes them relatively uh, useful uh, research subjects or participants. However, there are some distinct limits to it. Studies like Barracks, on the other hand, had high ecological validity. They used a meaningful task. We go to reunions, we look back at old yearbooks. This is an everyday activity. It's not like uh, pizza and pizza's trigrams or um, something like uh, Jacob's random numbers. Long-term memory may also encode information visually and acoustically, and we kind of know that we store people's speech patterns, and that's how we recognise their voice. And that you can think in different accents, different voices, if you want to. And one last uh, area three. There will be a short extension part to this uh, lesson, but I, this is the final part, the major bit. And that is that there may actually be a fourth type of memory. And this type of memory is referred to as priming. Now I'm going to talk to you a little bit about priming in class. This is a fascinating subject. I'll tell you about Dix de Hoos and Van Nippenberg's study if I haven't done so already. But priming is a type of implicit memory. And the idea is that exposure to a stimulus uh, influences the response to another stimulus. So if um, in a classic study they investigated... Um, the effect of uh, priming on the speed at which people walked away from the classroom. And they would prime these students with you know, words like slow and old and things like that. And the, the students actually walked out of the lecture theatres more slowly than the group that were primed with uh, faster words. Another example would be this. Think of a red fruit. Um, chances are you are not thinking of this red fruit, the name of which I've completely forgotten, Ranabutan or something, Rambutan, I think it may be. Um, chance that you think of a tomato or an apple. Priming, you already, if I say think of a red fruit, you're already thinking of particular th fruits, whether you want to or not. If I say think of a yellow fruit, you're thinking of a banana or a lemon. Yeah, some of you might be thinking of, of other things, but generally that's what people are thinking about. Why? because they're being primed. So this represents a fourth type of memory. As I said, we'll spend a bit of time on this. Okay, this is the A star extension, levels of processing. I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about this. Um, this is not compulsory, but this will enhance your answer and why you're here. You might as well stay, but I'm not going to test you on it. Levels of processing now. The idea behind levels of processing is Craig and Lockhart, two re cognitive researchers, developed this model of memory. Now, this is not an official model that you have to learn, but there's three very important um, elements to this model which are worth looking at. Their argument is this, that the depth at which you process information correlates with the amount of time that information is held for. So, in a basic form, the more shallow you treat the material, the the shorter period of time you retain it for and the less able you will be to recall that information later on. So they conducted an experiment in which participants were asked to analyse uh, words and sentences and, and concepts on what they referred to as three different levels. One would be a structural um, level and that's superficial. You might ask participants to say, whether or not the word has capital letters in it or something like that. You're just purely looking at the structure or if it looks like another word. Analyzing the structure of it. The second level is the sound of it. So does it rhyme? Does um, STM rhyme with, not STM, let's say does cat rhyme with mat? And by asking that question, you're actually processing it at a deeper level. It's not ultimately that deep. But it is, yeah, marginally. And then the deepest level is the semantic level. And that would be, is it a mammal? So 
d dog? Is it a mammal? Now that requires you to actually do some quite deep level processing because it requires an understanding of what a mammal is, whether a dog is one of them, some characteristics of the dog that check off and so forth. So it is a much deeper level of processing. The reason why I share this with you is because this is actually a really important uh, model for learning yourself. You are embarking on your revision now and you have been for some time. And what are you doing? Are you doing the structural stuff where you're laying it out in a cue card and making it look pretty? Or are you doing the hardcore heavy lifting where you're asking very deep semantic questions? Does Barrick adopt the cognitive approach? Give uh, an ecologically um, uh, a limitation regarding to the methodological procedure or whatever. So this is Craig and Lockhart's model. And you can try this out yourself. If you were doing a revision activity, you would ask, you know, was the researcher a cognitive psychologist? That requires a lot of knowledge and deeper processing than um, name a researcher in cognitive psychology. Yeah, very different. So that's all we have time for today. Thank you very much uh, for paying attention. As always, my door is open. If you have any questions, by all means, fire, fire them at me, um, email, uh, knock on the door, or contact me uh, via any medium that suits. Thank you very much, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.